You've been patient, you've had to wait a long time for our latest episode, but not quite the 55 years that England fans have had to wait. We are back. It is the Anglo-Italian pod. As always, I am Rory. You can follow us on Twitter at Italian Anglo pod. And I am joined by... Tommy, and you can find us on Instagram at Anglo-Italian pod. Holly fucking shit the anglo-italian pod has got it the anglo-italian final rory how do you feel about that it is honestly incredible the fan mail i spammed uefa with must have worked demanding that it was an italy england final come on like you know we need the publicity so this is like it is incredible it's like it's written in the stars and to be honest, before the before the tournament, I was kind of all bravado. And throughout the tournament, like, yeah, I want this England-Italy final. I want England-Italy final. And now it's here, I'm kind of like, ah, oh, crap, did I want this England-Italy final? <laughs> and I'm starting to double think about it. But it's going to be like, you couldn't make it up. The first year of the pod, Tommy. First year of the pod. First year of the pod, Inter win the Scudetto, and one of our two national teams is going to be crowned European champions. Dude, I'm also excited to be back. Listeners, we've missed you. It's been a busy summer for both Rory and I. Rory has been a little freer to jump on other people's pods. Right, Rory? Do you want to give any plugs to other pods you've been a guest of? Yeah, I've kind of mainly been on uh, Friends of the Show, the Hopeless Wanderer pod. I'll be on another show of theirs this evening that will be out tomorrow, which is today for you guys, so Friday. Um, so I've been working with them a little bit. Of course, we had the live show with uh, John Sinclair, which was great, the Newcastle fan. Um, so I've tried to keep busy, I tried to keep kind of plugging away at it, and I've been on Twitter the same amount as always, about eight hours a day. But yeah, it's been a bit of a busy summer. So we want to apologize for not quite being able to keep up with the regular pods as always. But we will be back in August. August? Yeah, yeah, yeah August. For... End of August, a little before the beginning of the National Leagues. We shall be back serenading you twice a week with our beautiful football conversations. And the other great news, Rory, I've just found out, I haven't told you yet, but I will be in Milan for the final. It's Wee! official. This I'm is going to be great. It's going to be great. So I'm, um, since listeners are wondering where I am, I'm in the Italian Alps right now wor- working at a summer camp. And as much as watching the Italy games with the kids at the summer camp has been fun i guess man i cannot i cannot miss this final it's the anglo italian final and so rory and the pod is the number one reason but then when italy won the world cup in 2006 i was in fucking eastburn england when inter won the treble in 2010 i was in minneapolis usa this time around i want to be with my friends i just talked to the director of the summer camp and she was like yeah free to go like if you care about it that much you're free to go that day so i'm very very pumped about that this is going to be good. You'll get to be there in person as you are brushed aside by the mighty Gareth Southgate and the Three Lions, right? At least you get to see it yeah, surrounded exactly. by your loved ones. Yeah, and a shout out also to our friend Michael O'Malley, friend of the pod, who's already a European champion. Um, his father being English. Congratulations, Michael. His father being English and his mom being Italian, he's already won it. <laughs> <laughs> in a way, Rory, you have too, right? Uh, in, a, in a more tenuous way, I think, yeah, I, I've always kind of said I'm more Irish Ita- Irish English than um, Italian Irish English, but I'll take it, you know, the, the surname's Italian, and I think, look, we're going to get onto the final, but obviously, 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 I want England to win this final, but if Italy win it, I won't be, like, angry or upset if you know what i mean it'll feel like if if england are gonna lose to a team i'd want it to be italy i suppose um but that doesn't mean i want england to lose i just want to make that we, clear i think we were talking about it uh, um after the england germany game or before the england germany game i said if we went to the final against england i wouldn't be so bitter if england won it you know, Italy's biggest rivals, France, Germany. Mm-hmm. There is some history also with Sweden because of the infamous Biscotto at Euro 2004. But, I mean, besides those two teams, like, there isn't that big of a rivalry with England. Of mm-hmm. course, of course, I want Italy to win. Oh, God, <laughs> I want Italy to win. <laughs> but losing to England wouldn't be as bad as losing to, you know, Mbappé or fucking Thomas Müller or whatever that would be. 
But Rory, so this episode, we kind of agreed that it's going to be centered more on the final. We're going to have another episode after the final to kind of sum up all of the Euros. But a few words about this tournament. General feelings. Have you been enjoying it? I think it's honestly been one of the best tournaments in my living memory. I think that, like, and I know it's easy to say that halfway through a tournament, but I remember things like um, South Africa 2010 was, like, really boring World Cup, and the 2004 Euros were pretty terrible because Greece. Uh, but I feel like this tournament, I think it's been the goalsiest Euros um, in history. And I love that before this tournament, there was only nine own goals in European Championship history. Now there's been 11 just in this tournament. I think it's been like just crazy entertaining. There's been some amazing goals. And it's been said quite a lot, but I'm going to say it again. After the rough 18 months, two years that we've been through, I think a football tournament to finish it off has just been exactly what a lot of people needed. Um, seeing the scenes in England now, it definitely makes me homesick um, and I do wish I could fly out for it, but I feel like there's a lot of like cath catharsis in this and a lot of people like as the restrictions are being lifted, we're being able to get together to celebrate this great thing. And even if your countries aren't winning it, I think each country had a moment of, apart from Scotland, maybe, although they did get a goal, they did get a goal. I think every every country has had a moment where they've been able to have that unity and celebrating together. And I think that is probably one of the the biggest positive for me after what how horrific the last two years have been. And also the Scottish, as we saw from the videos that were circulating on WhatsApp, they don't really need goals to celebrate and to be a writer, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, I think that after their history in tournaments, they've learned to just celebrate being there rather than waiting for the reasons to celebrate to arrive. Um, and, the, and the crazy stat that I heard yesterday during the England-Denmark game, which we'll get to, was that 48 million pints of beer have been sold in the UK yesterday alone. I kind of turned around at the, to the other people in the bar and I was like, did I hear right? 48 million pints Mate, of that beer. is... Honestly, I was watching the game with uh, the missus and she kind of repeated the stat... And it honestly made me a little bit more homesick. I was like, oh, God, I bet they're having such a good time. <laughs> I bet they're absolutely loving it. But what about you, Tommy? What have been your impressions, your thoughts on the tournament so far? So I've been, I've been traveling most June and July. I was uh, first in Spain visiting my, my family. Then I drove back. Uh, I actually stopped by in France, too, just to jinx it the day that they got out against the Switzerland. In the morning, I was there. I met up with a French friend of mine. We had a breakfast. We talked about football, and it was like, oh, man, having breakfast with an Italian before, like, round of 16 game, <laughs> maybe not a good idea. Turns out it wasn't. Well, it was for me. Uh, and then I've been, I've been briefly in Milan. We've hung out with Rory and our, our friends in common. And then I've been here in the mountains. So I've missed quite a few games, especially at the group stage. Mm -hmm. But, uh, man, I've, as you said, number one, it feels good to see football and to see fans at the stadium. Let's not think about what could happen in the next months, but let's just enjoy the moment. Our governments have taken this decision to open mm -hmm. the stadiums, and it's just beautiful to see you know, fans around and uh, enjoying, enjoying football and the, the players celebrating in front of their fans. And then it's been there have been some very, very good games. We'll get to it. But I think that that Italy-Spain final, uh, semi-final, mm. was one of the best games of football I've ever watched in my entire life. And uh, again, last night we had England-Denmark. Denmark, the dark horse of the tournament. They yeah. lost their first two games and then they qualified and then they just, they just went at it. And last night they looked fine already. They were not shy at all. They gave they gave a fight to England, and uh, another great game was England Germany. We saw that together, oh. and uh, it, it felt like things were changing in this tournament. You know, the usual narrative kind of uh, kind of w was interrupted, and uh, I don't know a lot of a lot of interesting talking points. Even Switzerland uh, eliminating France, the Belgian golden generation maybe coming to an end mm -hmm. after this loss in the tournament. The only thing that I was a little confused about was the criteria for the teams advancing to the round of 16 because the majority of the teams that qualified the third 
take Denmark. It took them only one game to get qualified. So that was uh, a little strange, in my opinion. And then there were a few soft penalties, but we'll get to that too. Um, I'm thinking, and I'm not thinking about last <laughs> night against Denmark. I'm thinking right, more of right. the the Belgian the Belgian penalty against the, against Italy. Okay, I that was pretty soft yeah. too. But what do you think about the third uh, the third team in the group stage, Ru? Yeah, I think it kind of ruined it a little bit. It took away a lot of the jeopardy in the group stage, like because even that group of death, right, with Germany, Portugal, and France, despite Hungary doing really well in that group, all three of them qualified. So therefore, there's no group of death. All of them got through, and I feel like a lot of the last games of the group stage, there was yeah, there was just no jeopardy there, and it was something that. I know UEFA are just trying to maximize how many games they can get and get more money. That's what their motive is for everything. But I think it takes away from the product a little bit in the group stage when you know that the majority of the teams are most likely going to go through. Um, and even though Ukraine were fantastic and they like you know were a very good team, but they they got through with one win. <laughs> like they got through, and you're like is that really enough? Should that be enough? Or should you have to actually earn getting through to the knockout round? I think, yeah, I'm not a big fan of like the third place uh, going through. I think it just took a bit away from the product. But like I said, I think when we did the post group stage um, pod, it is also my favorite time of, of the tournament because you get three, ma- three games a ma- three games a day. So I think um, I'm not going to complain too much. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and another thing, I, I love the World Cup. I love international tournaments in general. I love seeing national teams. But I love all the, I don't know, man. It, for example, the semifinals, it was the Mediterranean Sea on one side of mm-hmm. the bracket and the Atlantic Ocean on the other side of the bracket. <laughs> yeah, like the Vikings yeah. versus the Romans, basically. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. like Italy, Spain on one side and Denmark, England on the other one. Um, but let's get to the semifinals before we break down these long-awaited final, the Anglo-Italian final that we've been wishing for ever since the start of the tournament. Shall we start from Italy, Spain, Rory? Let's, please. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So, Spain. Let's talk about the Spanish team because the Spanish team, come the beginning of the tournament, they were not supposed to be doing that well. And in the group stage, they were rather underwhelming. They advanced from the round of 16 and the quarterfinals, thanks to overtime in one case and overtime plus penalties in the other game. So definitely not the Invincible Armada that we've been used to seeing in the in the past 10 years. That generation is gone. There is they are they are trying to create a new squad with a lot of new young talent. There is not anymore that Real Madrid block like backbone mm-hmm. or that strong Barcelona backbone that has pretty much always been there over the past ten years. But man, what a game they put up against Italy! And they also came into that game as the highest scoring team in the tournament. And I think that the the game that they played against Italy was absolutely outstanding. They did deserve a little more, but chance in this case wasn't really on their side. What did you make of it, Rory? Yeah, I was really impressed. I think this Spain team with a proper striker, I'm sorry, Morata, but this Spain team with a proper striker, they probably get through against Italy. I think they were playing that beautiful kind of Spanish football that we know them for, controlling the play, controlling the pace, beautiful little passes, but they just, it was a a theme for them throughout the tournament, but they created the most chances without like scoring many of them. Um, Against Italy, I was really, really impressed. The player that stood out to me, and I feel like I don't watch La Liga enough because obviously for the pod, we prioritize Serie A and we prioritize Premier League. I hadn't really watched Pedri that much and I didn't really know what to expect, but watching him, my God, I think it was Pepe Mel this week came out and said, not even Iniesta was that good at 18. And I think he's got a fair point. Like he completed 100% of his passes against Italy, which is mental. And not only that, he completely ran the game. It was all through him. And it's just him kind of dictating the, dictating the pace really. And just, 
like like the orchestra, the uh, the guy. What do you call the the conductor? Right, just watching mm-hmm. and what making the game flow and watching people in front of him. And I was just really really impressed by him. I think Danny Olmo is incredible. I think he needs a bit more composure. There was a few chances where I thought, oh, you could have done better there, especially the penalty. Um, but <laughs> really? but. I think he caused Italy all sorts of problems, and we'll get onto it why. But I think he is one of the reasons why I was slightly encouraged about England going against Italy because he caused that back three, the back five of Italy, whatever it was, he caused it a lot of problems. So I think he was really lively. Um, I was impressed with Oyathabal, even though he was very wasteful, I think he's also a very lively player, really hard to keep track of. So I think there's a lot of there's a lot of like green shoots in that Spanish team, but they just need a bit more time to develop and find a proper striker. Because Morata, okay, he scored against Italy in the end, and it was a beautiful move, very well taken goal, but he could have had a fair few more. And I just think he's got no compo- no composure and doesn't understand the offside rule still <laughs> still at, at almost 30 years of age hasn't figured it out no and really i thought you know zero nil nil against sweden we're talking about the group stage one one versus poland then the five nil against slovakia with i believe two own goals in that game mm-hmm. however but then come the time of the knockout stage, they won against Croatia in quite an emphatic style. Even oh, what though a game. They, what a game. They, they risked a lot at the end of that game. And then the, the game against Switzerland was a little bit underwhelming, but I feel like in every game there was a lot of there were a lot of positives to look at. Mm-hmm. I think that this Spanish team, again, the fact that they got all the way to the semifinal and they almost snatched it from a team like Italy, which we'll get on to, says that they could be contenders, I think, in the next World Cup. I think we were saying that off mic. And uh, Luis Enrique is, I think, I think this is this, his dimension. I think that he needs to, I think he's doing a very good job with the national team. And there is a lot of, there are a lot of bright sides to look at. Again, Pedri, unbelievable. The kid was born in 2002 or something. Don't say, oh, God. Man, yeah, <laughs> starting to feel older than we already do. But, um, yeah, man, he absolutely ran the game. Danny Olmo, too bad for the penalty. I mean, too bad. Good in the yeah, end. It was an awful They're penalty. It's not too bad. He just skied it. Like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, as you were saying, he, he lacks a bit of composure. He's been traveling around a lot over the past few years. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the, the reason, there is once again, I liked also the fact that Busquets who was the, you know, the veteran, the, the representative of the golden Federa- mm-hmm. uh, generation that is kind of fading away. Like I love the seeing him in the, as much as I hate Busquets. I was just about to say, I thought you hated him. <laughs> no, I hate him, but I highly respect him as a player mm-hmm. because Busquets is a player that once he retires, I think it's going to be in quite some time, but when he retires, we're going to look back and be like, holy shit, what a player yeah. Busquets was. And the seeing him in the middle of the pitch, representing that golden generation, surrounded by all these, you know, youngsters that grew up watching the team that won everything where he was in was very exciting to see. I have a question for you. What did you make of Unai Simon, the their goalkeeper in the game against Italy? I think he might be a good keeper. I think he might be a decent goalkeeper. I just think he will always be remembered at this tournament for that own goal. And I think it's everything I every time I watch him is through that lens. I think in the penalty shootout he could have done better. If like if there's one player you're going to study about how they take penalties in the Italy team, it's Jorginho, right? You're going to say, right, how does this guy take penalties? Because his success rate is ridiculous. I need to figure out how I'm going to stop him. The one thing you don't do is make your decision early against Jorginho because he's just going to, like he did, he just made him look stupid. And it's before he's even kicked the ball, Unai Simon has made his decision. And you're like, but I think... Across the tournament and in that game, I was still impressed with him. I thought he was a very competent goalkeeper. I think it's, he should he probably should be number one. Um, David De Gea has had some really up and down years with Manchester United. Um, so I think he's, he should be number one. And, and we're not even going to get onto Kepa, right? If he was even in the squad, I'm not sure. But like <laughs> Unai Simon, I think, was the good first choice. I think he's a very good keeper. He just, unfortunately, will be remembered for that 
ridiculous own goal. Why? What? And what were your What were your impressions of him? I I liked so from a tactical point of view. I think Luis Enrique did great. Basically, the the as you all know, the tactic was to break Italy's offensive plays, playing the goalkeeper very high, a la Neuer, we could say. And um, and then the other thing was not having a striker as a reference, and that created quite a few problems for Italy playing with a El Falso Nueve, as they call it in Spain. So Unai Simon, I think that that's not really his dimension. He did all right playing in that position as a sort of libero, as we call it in Italian. However, there was a moment when he made a terrible, terrible decision in front of Emerson. He kind of like ran mm. a little too late. Then Barella fucked it up massively. But that could have been another howler just because of indecision. And about the Jorginho penalty, man, really, you know what I think he thought? But, I, I mean, like, you cannot think so much at a penalty shootout. He was like, all right, the guy always takes a skip. Maybe this time around he's going to change it because yeah, he knows. Yeah, yeah. And while you're thinking about all this, Jorginho absolutely makes you look stupid. But let's get to the Azzurri. Rory, I want to hear your story. Did you watch the game with your Italian girlfriend? What was the atmosphere? Um, we did. We've had a bit of a, like, obviously every so often we've met up with the boys to watch the game, uh, especially in the group stage. But a lot, of the, um, a lot of the knockout games have been on school nights, so we've not been able to go out. But, the, um, yeah, we watched the semifinal together, and it was an incredibly exciting game. I think the whole time we were kind of both on the edge of our seats. Um, and I think... I'm just the the only name that is coming into my head now, and I just need to say it is just Chiesa, 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 Chiesa. I just need to talk that man. I'm a little bit in love with him, he, despite the fact he plays for Juve. I'm gonna like let him off with that, and he has got an extremely punchable face. <laughs> what a player! He is the player that scares me the most from an England perspective. He's the player where I'm like, oh crap, how are we gonna stop that guy? Um, he can literally like out of. Out of a dead play, he can become mm -hmm. dangerous as he did in the goal. Well, this is it, and he, like the goal came from nowhere. He just decided to pick it up and run, broke with it, and then just a beautiful finish. I think he is like obviously people who listen to the pod probably watch Serie A, but if anyone's listening to the pod who don't watch Serie A next year, watch Serie A and watch Chiesa because he is just absolute box office. He's a great player. And I think he is the one that it surprised me. He wasn't starting at the beginning, um, but Bernardi was playing very well. But obviously, since the extra time against Austria, he's obviously worked his way into the squad. And I think he's now he has to be like the first name on the team sheet, really, like with the with the key moments he's come up with for Italy. But I think um, Italy's performance it was kind of funny because at the beginning of the tournament, everyone was saying, "Oh, it's a new Italy. They're progressive. They're attacking. They're direct. They're." kind of the protagonist of the game. And then the second it kind of got difficult, they kind of reverted back to old Italy. And it felt like they were just sitting back and just waiting. And it wasn't quite Catanaccio because they didn't, they did take the lead, but it wasn't quite Catanaccio. But it was very like, oh, fuck, we're panicking. Right, let's just go back to what we know and just wait for them to break us down. And I think it was a bit disappointing to see that from Italy. But then against Spain, you're thinking, well, you're not really going to have the majority of possession anyway. Is it just the best way to just k try and catch them on the break? And evidently it is because it worked. Yeah, my we've we've covered already how my dad um, has kind of fallen out of love with football, but he's been watching the Euros. And he told me in the early stage of the Euros, he was like, this Italy team is fun. It's unlike mm -hmm. anything I've ever seen from Italy. And then we talked after the game against Spain. He was like, you know, all the excitement I was telling you about <laughs> All of a sudden, it felt like watching Italy in the 70s again, in the 80s, yeah. like that old technique of just like all behind the line of, ball, of the ball and then trying to, to score on the counter, which is what we did, exactly what we did. About the excitement of the game, I think that Spain delivered the vast majority of the mm -hmm. offensive excitement. However, I have to say that Italy sometimes had a few beautiful plays on the counter with like quick touches and quick verticalization. But Italy delivered that thing that Italy is known for. And that can be exciting when Italy do, which is just like, guys, let's stick together. Like in a fucking battle, let's create this wall, which is not only f about football. It's just really... Man, I think it, it starts fucking with your brain. When Spain had 75% of possession in the first uh, 
percent, no, sorry, 65 percent of possession. That's incredible. Can you imagine mm. how frustrating it is from a psychological point of view, knowing that you are absolutely running the game, but there is no way you can score a goal? And uh, I was very impressed that when they went down, they still had the the drive to score yeah. one goal to tie mm. it up. Um, it was the I have to say it was the, the the least beautiful game from Italy that we've seen in this tournament. It was the only draw that Italy have had in this tournament, which extends their unbeaten run to thirty three games, only two games away from a record world record detained by Brazil and Spain. We shall see if that stays alive or if the mighty three lions are going to interrupt <laughs> that beautiful streak. About the players, I have to say, well, of course, Chiesa, in case you didn't know, he basically rescued Pirlo's job until the end of the season. He saved his ass on so mm -hmm. many occasions at Juventus this year. It's beautiful to see him turn, in, turn up for Italy. He's the, I think he's the best talent together, arguably, with Donnarumma, the best young talent that we mm -hmm. have in our squad. That goal was out of nowhere. I was watching the play again uh, before we started recording this pod today um, with the aerial view. You see Donnarumma picks up the ball, scoops it up to Verratti. Verratti starts running and Chiesa is running in the middle of the pitch. He understands in a split second where the ball that Laporte intercepts is going to go. And with such an incredible cool, he just walks there. The ball is still on the ground, dribbles a player, Far corner, pff, beautiful finesse shot. And that's 1-0 in a semifinal. As if he hadn't already scored a super heavy goal against <laughs> Austria. And man, from a te technical point of view, that goal is so yeah. hard to score. Put it down with your head. It was a very powerful ball. Put it down with your head. Dribble the defender. Far post goal. So I think that definitely he's the Italian offensive player who can deliver the biggest threat. Underwhelming game from Barella. Possibly his worst game in the uh, was. I was Yeah, I was really disappointed by him. He gave the ball away a lot. He was caught out of position a lot. Um, obviously, you talked about the moment with Unai Simon where he tried to cut inside rather than taking it first time. I just think maybe the occasion got to him a little bit. I think, look, we, we all love Barella on this show with the season he's just had at Inter. And we know how great a player he is and how great he's been throughout the tournament. I just think it wasn't his best game. If we're talking about players that have had a terrible game, I'm going to go to players that have had a terrible tournament. Can you describe to me, what is Immobile? What is he? What is his role? What does he do? I'm starting to lose my mind watching him play. I think... Um. Like, like, sorry, before I know I've asked you a question, I continue to talk, but before I let you go, Belotti isn't that great, right? But he's making Belotti look like the greatest target man in the world because when Belotti comes on, he's able to actually hold the ball up and give it to somebody else. Immobile, I've not seen him do it once, like, it no. is insane. It is insane. Immobile is really, I. it's like playing with men less at times. Mm -hmm. There was a moment against Spain when he had three touches and he managed to advance along the pitch. And I was like, holy fuck. Oh yeah. My God, look at that. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> first time he's done it yeah. in these Euros. He was lucky in the first two games. He had a goal and an assist. He showed up when he should have. But then after that, he doesn't deliver anything to our to our attack. However, Mancini keeps sticking with him. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's like a sort of talisman type of thing. Like we've won every game with with Immobile as a starter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll stick to that system. But I'm starting to... I mean, and right now it would be even dangerous maybe to change the entire lineup. Well, this uh, is it. What you don't want to do before a final is drop your main striker, right? I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying if I have to watch him one more time, be one yard behind a ball that's been put into him, I'm going to pull my hair out. I hope it continues into the final. I really do. But watching the whole tournament, it's just been like... Look, and I think throughout the season, I've talked about Immobile and how I think he's a little bit overrated. But watching this tournament, he's just been terrible terrible yeah. i think insigne and chiesa and even berardi have been the bigger threats in the front three and immobile has just been completely ineffective even even insigne has been slightly underwhelming he's been hot and cold definitely yeah but man berardi whenever he's come on berardi has got an incredible incredible touch 
<laughs> which like is the the polar opposite to what Immobile has he doesn't have anything <laughs> but like there were a few very difficult balls like that he put down super comfortably dribbled the player shoot on target he did it twice in like 20 minutes against Spain so that was very impressive um Talking about our midfield in the game against Spain, I think that a lot of the credit for Barella's bad game goes to Busquets and Pedri yeah. because they were giving Jorginho, Barella and Verratti a headache. Mm-hmm. They didn't know what to do. As you can see on the goal scored by Morata, there are at least two midfielders that are laid on the cover. Morata is alone. He can walk towards the box, pick his man, Dani Olmo, for a quick give and go. And then Bonucci and Chiellini, they can't do much, but just watch Morata score the goal. Talking about our defense, Bonucci and Chiellini. Hmm. Not a great record in finals for their club, Juventus. <clears throat> but at almost 80 years of age combined, they keep being the wall that people have, have, have called them for the past five, six years, I want to say. Um, how does it feel, Rory, to go into a final against those two men at centre back? Now, I have to firstly say the the videos that have come out since the semi final only make me love Chiellini more. Especially his absolute mind games with Jordi Alba were, <laughs> were just beautiful. It was incredible, um, and Bonucci being mistaken for a pitch invader was great, and his reaction was actually very good. At first, he got quite angry, then he kind of hugged the steward and was like, "Oh, don't worry." So I think, look, both of them are just. I love how I love their relationship. I really love their relationship. When they block a ball or when they block a shot, they both just turn around to each other and like bump chests or like scream at each other. And you're like, oh, these guys fucking love playing together. They love defending. Like they are obviously incredible defenders. There were a few situ- there were two shots on target from Spain that were saved respectively by Chiellini and Bonucci. Mm. I feel like when Donnarumma has a save, they're almost disappointed. They're like, ah, <laughs> God damn it, I should have got it with my butt yeah. or with my thigh. Like, <laughs> fuck it. Like, if it gets, it feels like if it gets to the goalkeeper, they feel like they fucked up. They yeah. should have, they should have gotten that ball. That's beautiful to see. But also, man, I've been very, very impressed. Well, we've all been very impressed with the Spinazzola, definitely one mm-hmm. of the players of the tournament. Emerson Easily. didn't quite deliver the same threat that he has been delivering in these Euros when he was played in the game, game against Spain due to Leonardo Spinazzola's injury. But I've been very impressed also with our right back, Mr. Di Lorenzo from Napoli. He's been, he, he's not like the outstanding player, but he does what he needs to do. Mm-hmm. He delivers offensive balls. He, he's very good at covering. He had a very good, um, he had a few very good tackles against Spain. And um, yeah, I think that our defense, including the, the fullbacks, the, sorry, the, the right and left backs, mm-hmm. um, has, been, has been very solid. And we need to talk also about Gianluigi Donnarumma. Is this the year? That he's been that he's crowned one of the best goalkeepers in the world, in your opinion? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think honestly, again, I've not really watched much AC Milan, so I've not really seen much of him. But he's just a monster. He's absolutely huge. Every time I see him, I'm like, the guy is massive. He's six foot five, and he looks like he's six foot five across as well. Like when he was stood, and when you know they've got like kind of FIFA angle of the penalty shootout, right? And he's You've got the guy lined up to take the kick, and you just see Donnarumma there, and you're like, where are you going to put this ball? Because no matter where you put it, he's got it. Like, the guy is huge. Um, I think he's been... There was a few games... Now, I think it was the Switzerland game where Switzerland finally had a chance, and then Donnarumma just pulled off this amazing save. And you're like, fucking hell. Even when you do get through the defense, they've got the best keeper in the world. So you're like, how do you... like? And it is... I think he's definitely up there now. He has to be up there now. And I think... I, I'm so annoyed he's going to go to PSG. What a waste! What a waste! Yeah, it's we, you can you can talk about like his you can dis, you, you you can discuss about his controversial decisions about leaving the club, his boyhood club that has brought him <laughs> up just to go get a bag of money at PSG. But I have to say that I haven't. I, I'm a big fan of goalkeepers, and if I've always felt like Donnarumma was a little bit too hyped. However, this season at AC Milan was his best season. He's at for the Rossoneri. And uh, in these years, we've seen him pull off very few saves, but all of those saves were crucial. The mm-hmm. best one so far, 
the one against De Bruyne with his left hand. We know that De Bruyne is known to shoot absolute rockets. That was one of them. And he got it with his big top hand. And that was amazing to see. Another very good save on Lukaku. The other night, again, a good save on Dani Olmo. Mm -hmm. The first one was blocked by by Bonucci. The second one was a super powerful shot towards the bottom right, saved again by Donnarumma. And then he also had a penalty save, a crucial penalty save at the end of the game. And what I loved about that, don't forget that the guy is 22 years old. In the meantime, Rory's ceiling is about to is cracking. Is it, also, it, it is it is storming in Milan like you would not believe, and it sounds like someone's breaking through my window. But I promise you, I'm sat in a dark room as well, which doesn't help. Uh, so I keep thinking someone's going to kick the door in. But I, I promise you, it's just a storm. But I'm just freaking out a little bit. But um, um what are we saying about Donnarumma? Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> what I loved about saving the no, don't worry about that. What I loved uh, about the penalty save on Morata is that he didn't celebrate afterwards. The thing that he did mm -hmm. was tightening his gloves. He didn't do anything, and I was just like, "Thank God!" I wouldn't have liked to see him like celebrate as if no, he had no. won it because there was another crucial penalty. So it was like, you know what? I'm gonna tighten up my gloves. I'm ready for the next one in case Jorginho misses. And here goes a nice little leeway to talk about, in my opinion, Italy's outstanding man at these Euros, Jorginho Frello, I believe is his second mm -hmm. name, last yeah. name. Always tough with Brazilians to figure out. Champions League winner as a starter and as a key pawn in the, in the checkboard for Chelsea. He's found this dimension in Italy's squad as well. Don't forget that Ventura our former coach that didn't qualify us to the World Cup said that there was not room for him in the Italy national team. Besides that penalty, that holy shit, I've covered it on the pod so many times, that little skip that he does makes me skip a few hard <laughs> every time. Well, he plays for Chelsea, so I don't really care. But I was like, when he does that for Italy, man, it's going to be a nightmare. He did make me miss a few heartbeats, but that was an incredible penalty. And it just shows how, how much composure he's got, how much talent, and how much he can, he can play under pressure. What have been your impressions about him? I have always liked Jorginho as a player. I think he's the metronome. He's that guy who just keeps the ball moving. His passing rate is ridiculous. I think, look, he doesn't get many goals. He doesn't get many assists. That's not his job. His job is to be the passer in midfield, and he's very bloody good at it. I remember that... Um, now, here you go, listeners. First mention, Arsenal were linked to him last year, um, and a lot of Arsenal fans were losing their mind, going, we don't bloody want him. I was like, Jesus Christ, he's exactly the player we need. He is exactly what we need in that midfield. I think he is an incredible player, and I think he's really shone this tournament and it, like you said in the Champions League um, campaign I think look there's a lot of like on Twitter now like if he wins does he get Ballon d'Or it's like alright let's not fucking let's not get ahead of ourselves Ballon d'Or doesn't just mean pick a random player who won the Champions League and they're the best player in the world that's not what it means but he's had an incredible year and he's I think people are finally looking up and realizing what a player and what type of player he is I think people just expect things from him it's like expecting goals from your centre-back. It's like, well, that's not his bloody job. His job is something else. Jorginho's job is to keep the ball moving, to keep the passes high, and to kind of find those little gaps. And that's what he does. And that's what he does incredibly well. And don't forget that the man who brought Jorginho to Stamford Bridge is fucking Maurizio Sarri. <laughs> the, the man that was just like treated like shit from Chelsea and Juventus. Did you see the dig that he had at Juventus the other day? That was beautiful. I did. He also talked about Ronaldo as well. He did I, a little I didn't bit. See, I didn't see the quote-unquote about Ronaldo, but I loved what he said about Juventus. He was like, when I was here, everybody was expecting the Scudetto. They didn't even celebrate. There was not even a team dinner. Mm -hmm. He was like, but this year then, they got fourth and they celebrate like it was a Scudetto. Maybe I got there the wrong year. And I was like, yes, Maurizio, I like to see that. <laughs> I love it. He is going to have such an agenda next year with Lazio. He's going to be like on the hunt for Juve. It's going to be an absolute agenda. You love to see it. But look, we need to, before we get carried away with the league season, should we go to England against Denmark? Should we talk about Let, England, Denmark? And then we can go to, to 
just a, just a little quick thing. Italy are getting to the final after having scored 3, 6, 7, 9, 11, 12 goals in their six games. So an average of two goals per game. Rory is looking a little scared. And they've conceded three goals, which is actually more than we usually do. But I'm feeling confident about this final. I feel the best comment I've ever heard about this team so far is that it doesn't look like a national team, but it looks like mm. a club. And they really, I really think it's a true statement. Let that sink in. But let's talk about the rivals that the Azzurri are going to face in the final for the first time since football was invented. England are <laughs> in the final. <laughs> what the fuck, Rory? Did Mate, you cry last night? Is that true? It's mental. Honestly, the whole day, me and the boys have been on WhatsApp just like, Guys, we're in a final at Wembley on Sunday. Can you believe it? I'm like, I have to keep repeating it to myself. I cannot believe it's happening. Um, it was kind of a, a, a regular conversation between me and my friends. Was always, do you think? Do you think we'll live to see England win anything? Like honestly, we'd be like, do you think in our lifetimes England will win anything? And more often than not, the answer would be no, probably not. Um, and the quick turnaround that we've, a relatively quick turnaround we've had under Gareth Southgate has to be lauded at this point. Look, it might not be the most entertaining football. It might not be the most exciting. It might not be Tiki Taka, but he's got us to consecutive semi finals, now a final. He got us to the Nations League final. He's brought us to the Nations League semi final, which I know, look, your opinion on that competition may be different, but to get to the semi final is still impressive. Um, I think, and he's also, what he's done best over this period as England manager is he's put a lot of ghosts to bed, kind of thing, right? So there was the penalty shootout hoodoo, touch wood, in case we get to penalties on Sunday, but the penalty shootout hoodoo he got rid of, kind of, or well, basically he did, against Colombia in the World Cup. He then got us to a semi-final for the first time since 1990, which was a massive thing on our, like, the English media forever going on about Italia 19, how he got to the semi-final. So he got us past that. Then in the Euros, he's now got us past this Euro 96 thing that we kept going on about. We beat Germany, which is the biggest chip on the shoulder in English football. He's managed to beat Germany in a knockout game at a major tournament. And it seems like he's kind of putting these things to bed and just getting them out of the way and going no, this is a New England team. We don't need to keep thinking about the history. We don't need to keep going on about how we failed in the past. We can just talk about how we might do well in the future. And I think this is what he's done most successfully. Um, the thing that, Another thing I want to credit him with is the squad that he's put together. Now, I think when he picked the squad, there was a lot of people who were kind of, including myself, who were going... Why has he picked him? That's a weird one. I don't know why he's picked so many right backs, but every time someone questions him, he's proven that he's right. right? It's always come out the way that he wanted it to. So whether it's playing Trippier at left back in the first couple of games, worked really well. Whether it's playing Bakayo Saka over Phil Foden, because Saka was only meant to be the 26th man, who has now gone on to be one of England's key players, whether it's not starting Grealish, but using him on later in the games, where he does have an effect. Every time people question him and say, oh, I'm not sure he's, he's doing the right thing, it, it, it works. Even the formation change against Germany, he went for the 3-4-3, and it worked. And you think, this guy really knows how to prepare for opponents. He really knows how to prepare specifically for games and what systems work, and what his players are capable of doing. He knows what to ask them to do and what to not ask them to do. Um, and I think I've just been incredibly, incredibly impressed by him. Some managers are better suited to international management. At club management, he never did that well. He is an international manager. And to think that if big Sam Allardyce hadn't had a pint of wine and offered <laughs> to be bribed, we would none of this would be happening, right? Southgate accidentally kind of fell into the job, and it's without sounding like over dramatic, it has changed English football forever. The fact that he is in the job and not be, uh, not Sam Allardyce. It's incredible. Yeah. And like the fact we're in a final just blows my mind. I think that the turning point for England was definitely the win against Germany. That's another ghost that mm -hmm. you're putting to bed, losing to Germany at any, any given time that you play them. That game was a very convincing display. England ended up winning 2-0. They could have had even a few more. And that game, I was just like, wow, this team have got it. 
But how do you so from from any time perspective? And last night in the in our common chat with our friends, our Italian friends, we were going crazy about it. We're like, where the fuck are Foden and Sancho? But even without them, England are performing. Do you think that? Do you think it's understandable that people who are outside of the uh, of England look at it and they're like, this is a crazy decision, or have you come to terms with it? I think I've come to terms with it because it's the system that we're playing and the system that we need to play needs certain players. And Gareth knows what players they are. I think, and it's also, it shows a crazy, crazy squad depth in the English squad that I've never, ever seen before. The fact that we can bring off the bench, we can bring off the bench Phil Foden and Jaden Sancho and Jack Grealish. We can, that has never happened for England before. Where we, I've looked at the bench and gone, man, we've got we've got so many options here. And I think this is like, it's just really, really exciting, really exciting. And the fact that this is still a very young team, right? I think the oldest players are probably. I'm going to go quickly through my head: Jordan Henderson, Sterling, Kyle Walker. Even they've got one more tournament in them, two more tournaments in them, if you know what I mean. So it's like it's a very young squad. And what I like about this England squad even more is that it's very reflective of England, right? Now, I'm going to go into a bit of a monologue. I apologize. But my relationship with the English national team has always been quite complicated because growing up, I was Irish, English, like a big part of me didn't feel English. And when you did go and watch England games or you'd be in the pub watching England games, it was always people singing two World Wars, one World Cup, 10 German bombers, and no surrender to the IRA, right? Now, I'm not pro-IRA, but as someone who is half Irish, it makes you quite uncomfortable. And I always never really celebrated England victories, never really got behind them. But I feel like more recently, the team has come to represent the country a lot more. I think the team feel a lot more relatable, especially the, a lot more relatable than the kind of golden generation in 2002 to 2008, whatever it was. That team would just felt like that stereotypical footballers that didn't really care. They thought it was their right to play for England. Whereas this squad, it represents the multiculturalism of England. It represents the overriding view in England that racism is bad by taking the knee before every game. They're not willing to be used as pawns by the government in this propaganda they want to do. They're calling out like prime ministers, Marcus Rashford feeding hungry kids when the, when the government refused to like, it is so hard not to love this team. And I think my attitude with the English national team over the last couple of years has just shifted completely because of this. And now I never thought I would wear an England shirt, right? Because the only people in the past for me, I, through my perspective, and not only mine, but of quite a few people were the people who walked down the street in England shirts probably held certain political views. Whereas now it's much more acceptable to be an England fan because of more more people are proud to be England fans because of this team and because of what's being shown through the manager and through the players whenever they're in the press whenever they speak they're all just really just seem like nice guys who just want to get on and win something for the country and I think it's honestly there's been such a big shift in my attitude towards the country through this team and that could be actually a very good storyline for this final Italy England because the Italy team, despite being very different from the English team in terms of political awareness, e.g. refusing as an institutional move to take the knee unless Lukaku is playing there and they will take the knee against England too. Mm -hmm. They didn't in, the previous, in this game against Spain. Spain didn't either. But whatever, despite this uh, political difference which you highlighted and is very true, I think that what both teams have in common is that they conquered the hearts of their supporters mm -hmm. again. Don't forget that this is our first international tournament after missing out on Russia's world on the World Cup in Russia. So Mancini's job was super duper difficult. Oh my God, super duper. So, so <laughs> long. Was very was extremely difficult <laughs> to gain the heart of Italians again. They mm -hmm. started to see this generation of players, which are the players born around my time. So mm -hmm. from 1988 to 1995, as players who just cared about their clubs, their image, their bags of money, but didn't really care about wearing the Italy shirt. Well, this team, they've been doing a lot of singing, you might have seen on social media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe a little yeah. too much. But it's actually <laughs> nice to see. It's nice to see. It feels like a team that is very, very close to the people. Mm -hmm. 
And if we know something about Italian teams, the Italian teams that have gotten to the end of a tournament are teams that were able to conquer the hearts of fans. Mm -hmm. So that's a beautiful storyline. Thank you for the leeway. Rory, strength and weakness of the English squad, if you had to pick one for each. The strength is the ability to control the game. They, I've never seen England set the tempo of games. I've never seen them, even last night, uh, in the last two minutes of extra time, when, in theory, you'd be thinking that Denmark would be throwing the kitchen sink at the goal and England would be on their goal line. They had a 54-pass move in the minute where they were just passing the ball around and just... Obviously, Denmark was shattered by that point, and I did feel quite sorry for them. But just England's ability to just control the game has blown my mind. I, we were talking just before off mic about how I think... England have controlled every game this tournament. There's not been a game where I've thought, oh, we're in trouble here. Yeah? Now, you might say, well, we've not had hard opponents, but we we controlled the game against Germany, right? We controlled, definitely controlled the game against Ukraine, who maybe it was a step too far for them, but we've shown they're no mugs, right? Denmark played really well yesterday, and we still managed to control the game. Even when we went a goal down, I was like, nah, don't worry, we've got it. And I think the confidence that this team has instilled in me is the strength of that team. It's just that they seem so assured and certain of what they need to do. Um, the weakness after last night, I would arguably say the goalkeeper, despite Jordan Pickford having a very, very good tournament and the defence having a very good tournament and him, he broke Gordon Banks' record for England yesterday by one minute for the longest time of not conceding a goal for, for an England keeper. But he did have quite a few mistakes in him yesterday and he does worry me. If we get Everton Pickford back, then uh, I don't feel that confident. Um, beyond that, I don't really see many like famous last words before we get pumped at the weekend, but I don't really see many weaknesses in the team. I think we've got the attacking creativity. We've got Harry Kane, who I'm fully willing to hold my hands up and say, okay, Harry, don't listen to me. Don't You don't need to just stay in the box. Do what the frig you like, because his passing is incredible. It, that, that, ball, that's night against that ball for Saka was mind-blowing. And I think, so we've got that, attack and creativity we've got the solidity in midfield Declan Rice and Calvin Phillips the fact that Jordan Henderson isn't starting in this midfield is mad like Rice and Phillips have just made sure that we don't need him um and I think the the defense with Stones Walker and Maguire like you've got Maguire and Stones who are both great ball playing defenders like Maguire's great in the air you've got Stones on the on the ground and then you've got Walker who just is pace at 31 his pace, he is able to just cover. He just, last night, he was on the right-hand side blocking the ball. Then the next minute, he was on the left-hand side blocking the ball. And he just zips around. And I think that that three work really, really well. Um, Luke Shaw has been incredible. Like, he's he's what, becoming what? the player that everybody thought he could be pre-Mourinho. Pre-Mourinho fucking dismantling the guy's like confidence like we knew Luke Shaw could be a good player and we're finally seeing that he's becoming a very fucking good left back I think this team I honestly can't see many weaknesses beyond the goalkeeper I think one of the strengths that is one of the things that worries me the most is a man by the name of Raheem Sterling when the oh. guy decides to go forward there is nothing stopping him he's got these quick little messy like steps he can take on any defender he's got great vision he can shoot on target even though yesterday he wasn't as cynical as we are used to seeing him but man he's got to be tired too he's been playing every single game i think he's one of key uh, england's key men and i think that if italy need to worry about something Against the Spain, it was the web of passes. Against mm -hmm. England, it's going to be the speed. Because as you said, Walker, Sterling, even Maguire yesterday. Mm -hmm. I mean, he I don't consider him a top defender in the world, but he's a solid, he's a solid defender and he can run the pitch. He can run the pitch, he can pick a pass. So Italy definitely need to watch out for England's speed because we don't have that many fast players. Our fastest player just tore his Achilles tendon and he's out for the rest of the competition. Insigne is like the, you know, those memes like, mom, can we get Raheem Sterling? No, don't worry. We've got <laughs> Sterling at home. And then you see a picture of Insigne. You see, like, that's, that's what we, that's our Sterling. 
But I'm um, sorry, you were going to say? No, I think with Sterling, the thing is, you said that he's got to be tired. Mate, at the 120th minute last night, he was still bombing down the pitch, ran past two substitutes, and still got a shot on target, which, which forced Schmeichel into a great save. The guy's engine is ridiculous. And I think I could not be happier. The the only player I'm arguably happier for is Bakayo Saka because, as everybody's aware, I'm obsessed. But Sterling, I am so happy for him because he has had an absolute kick in from the press in England for years. They've never liked him. And he's now arguably been the, the player of the tournament, right? He's been England's 100%. player of the tournament. He has been incredible. And for him to score all these goals and have all these performances in a stadium that he grew up 50 metres away from... I absolutely love it. I think there was ugh, typical like English kind of presumption, but there was things on Twitter today like if England win, there's rumours that Gareth Southgate will be knighted and Raheem Sterling. If the Sun have to call Raheem Sterling Sir Raheem Sterling, I will, Jesus Christ, that would be incredible. If anyone has earned it, it is that man. The guy has had an absolute kick in. He's a great player and he's stepped up for England at a time that you couldn't ask for better timing. He's been incredible. I love it. I absolutely love it. Sorry, I was just thinking about something. You said knighted, and I was thinking about the institutions and politics and shit. Let's not go down there. Let's not go down there. Sorry, it would be after Brexit. It would be very funny if England won the Euros. You know, like <laughs> the continent that they'll you don't still want to manage. Be part oh, of. They'll still manage to twist it into their own agenda. But I'm not getting into it. I just hope we bloody win it. But I think, look, looking at the game last night. We've got to say Damsgaard, hell of a goal. What a player. What a player. Um, the fact they took him off kind of confused me. I know he was a little bit tired, but I thought, oh, you're taking off the one player that's been the biggest threat to us there. <laughs> like, cheers. Um, <laughs> if I could have picked a substitution for you, it might have been that one. Um, so I think that was a confusing one, but I think De Denmark played very well. Kasper Schmeichel, if we're going to talk about great goalkeepers, Kasper Schmeichel has to be up there now. Arguably arguably as good, if not better, than his dad at this point. The guy's been incredible. Um, and I think he's, he's made... He's his own man now, if you know what I mean. He's no longer Peter Schmeichel's son. He's Casper Schmeichel, if you know what I mean. No, no, and it's no, like... 100%, 100%. His, the, the, save, the saves he made... Shadow, yeah. yeah, the saves he made last night were incredible. So I think I was really impressed by Denmark. Myla is incredible. They've got a very, very good team there. Um, but England made it comfortable. They made it comfortable in the end. Obviously, it went to extra time, but in extra time, I thought we will get the goal. The goal's coming. Um, and if anyone is going to write in or complain that it wasn't a penalty, it was a penalty. He got, there was two points of contact. Did he go down soft? Yes, he did. But in the VAR world, where they're not going to overturn the on-pitch decision, that was a penalty. So keep crying, Italian fans who are afraid of England. No, that was definitely a similar penalty to the one that we were that Belgium were given against mm -hmm. Italy. It was it was a little contact, but you know we've we've seen we've seen similar penalties at these Euros, so it's not a scandal in my opinion. And England did, definitely haven't cheated their way to the final. I want to say a few words about Denmark too. After what happened to Christian Eriksen and after losing the first two mm -hmm. games, it was kind of unthinkable that they would get this far in the tournament. And there has been, I hate this type of talk, like all the Italians on, you know, Rory is the Twitter guy. I'm the Instagram guy because I'm kind of a retard and I need to look at pictures for things. <laughs> but instead of reading, I have a hard time in reading. Um, <laughs> no, but the word, man, all these things about like, yeah, Italy will be supporting Denmark, blah, 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 blah. I was just like, man, I would be as worried if Denmark were in the final because yeah, Denmark yeah, yeah. caused yeah. multiple threats to England and they did not look like they were there for some sort of like accident. It looked like they were there because they fully, fully deserved it. Well, this so, well, this is it. Before the game, like, and it's not like the English to be arrogant, right? But there was a lot of people in England <laughs> saying, ah, oh, 2-0, 3-0, this will be easy. Just turn up and we'll beat them. I was like, you guys are fucking idiots. This is not a team that are there because they've won a raffle. This is a team that have fucking earned their place in the semifinals. And on a different night, possibly could have got to penalties and could be in the final. If you know what I mean? I think... Like there's some of the disrespect shown towards them from some of the English tabloids was a bit 
or very distasteful. Um, but yeah, you're right. With the whole Ericsson story, I think it's just a beautiful thing to see them do so well in the tournament. You can see that team spirit takes you a long way as well as talent and hard work. Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. And uh, sorry, two more things that I wanted to say before we quickly break down the final and we see what we could expect from this final game. By the way, it was kind of hard at the beginning of the pod. I, I wasn't used anymore to recording and yeah, talking yeah, yeah, on yeah. a mic and everything. But now I'm on it. So two, <laughs> other things, two other things. One thing that also looked very weird to me about this tournament is that Italy, for example, played all the group stage games in Rome and so did England at Wembley. Mm -hmm. The fact that the semifinals and the final are played all in the same stadium, that is huge home turf advantage for England. Um, and another thing that I wanted to say, now, Rory, I think you should also share what you were saying earlier about Prem heads and Serie A heads. But could we say that this tournament has been the Serie A tournament? Because so many players, even I was looking at uh, Denmark's squad right now off the top of my head from last night. Mele plays for Atalanta. Kjaer mm -hmm. plays for AC Milan. Eriksen wasn't there, but he plays for Inter. Damsgaard plays for Sampdoria. Then we've seen the rise of Gozens for Germany. Could we say Rabiot making a start for mm -hmm. France again after moving from PSG to Juve? Could we say that this tournament helped the people realize that Serie A is a better league than what many people think? Undoubtedly. I think it's been a boost for Italian football in general. I think people still had that image, especially because you missed out on the 2018 World Cup. I think people still had a certain image of the Italian team and the Italian league. And I think seeing this now with, I think still the most man of the matches have come or men of the matches have come from uh, Serie A. I think the new style of football that Italy have been playing on the whole, except from the semi-final, I think it's been a big boost for Italian football in general. And even the kind of the boys that I've been talking to at home have kind of said, well, you know what? I might kind of watch a few Serie A games next year because if they're playing like this, and it's got to be half decent, if you know what I mean. So I think that people still had a certain idea of Italian football. And I think maybe this tournament has shown them that that idea might be a bit, old fashioned and maybe not as relevant as they think it is. Um, but I think it's great seeing so many Atalanta players. is just incredible. I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, even like Melanchuk for um, Russia. Right. And there's been so many, um, the player who stood out for me the most is Spinat Sola, right? He's been, like we said, we talked about potentially player of the tournament and definitely in team of the tournament. Um, I think he's really impressed me. And I think a lot of the kind of my mates at home weren't aware of him at all. And were like, how have I not seen this guy? How do I not, how, how do I not know who this guy is? He's incredible. Um, so I think, yeah, it's been a huge boost for Italian football, but I think we've talked about it off mic as well about how on the kind of like trying to grade the leagues now, like for a while, the best league in the world, well, the best league in the world has kind of always been the Premier League, right? Not always, but in recent times, right? Yeah. Over the last 10 years, the Premier League has yeah. been the best. And then I would I say, arguably, La Liga has been behind it, right? But I think recently, since Ronaldo left, I think Serie A has kind of overtaken it in the quality and the competitiveness. And I think maybe it's kind of moving one level up just behind the Premier League in the best leagues in the world. So I think, yeah, it's been a huge boost, huge boost for Italian football. And living in Italy, I'm fucking loving seeing it. It's incredible because I... I love Serie A. I love watching it. And I love Italian football. So I want more people to watch it and love it and see it, right? And can, can I say, well, we'll not make names, but there are a bunch of blue ticks that, you know, just like, there have been some blue ticks on Twitter, like saying that people should pay more attention to Italian football, but sounding super arrogant towards the it's... Premier League. <sighs> Guys, shut the fuck up. Enjoy the football. Like it's football over the place. The styles might be different and everything, but it's there is no. I mean, yeah, you can argue that a, a league is more exciting than another one. Well, at that point, fucking watch the championship, which is probably the <laughs> best league in the world. <laughs> the in terms of yeah, yeah. So stop like making this competition, and especially Italians that are saying that England England cheated their way to the final. Guys, shut the fuck up. They deserve to be there. They beat Germany. We all celebrated when they did. Are we intimidated? Like he, I don't even know historically if we are favored in this final or not. Well, I think I was looking at the record. Italy definitely have the better head to head. Definitely have the better head to head in games. Um, but See, yeah, it's this whole. It's this whole to play, to play a good team. That, that's it. Yeah, it's this whole movement of like 
So I've noticed it throughout the season. It's like an in Serie A, like the Serie A accounts, especially on Twitter. Now we all know Twitter is a pretty poisonous place, but it's like they call them Prem heads, right? It's people that only watch the Premier League and then like are like ignorant to any other football, right? And they kind of judge people for not knowing like Atalanta's backup left, like backup left back. And you're like, really, is this what we're judging people for? And then you see the same people who then only watch Serie A and when they watch Jack Grealish for 20 minutes and he's maybe not as great are suddenly saying he's not the great player he is, he is undoubtedly is. I think it's just this um, football hipsterism snobbiness of like, oh, do you not know that guy? Have you not seen that team? Oh my God, I've known about that guy forever. And it's just this horrific hipster-ishness that's really doing my head in. But yeah, a lot of Italian accounts kind of breaking down how England shouldn't be in the final. It's like, well, we fucking are, so deal with it. And when we beat you, you best deal with that as well. Cry more, please. I was thinking of one last player. Actually, I checked it on the lineups that plays in Serie A and was in a European Championship semi-final last night. Fucking Striger Larsen for Udinese. Oh, <laughs> oh, I had him in fantasy last year. <laughs> Got yeah, the yeah, own yeah, goal yeah. and sent off. Yeah. But Rory... Very quickly, because we have to go soon, what should we expect from this final in your opinion? You start, I'll go after you. It's going to be cagey. It's not going to be exciting. It's not going to be exciting. I think it's going to be two teams who don't want the ball (laughs) and two teams who are trying to figure out... It's two teams trying to catch each other on the break, right? Because I think that's what England have done. They've kind of controlled the game, controlled the tempo, but they've not really been like mad exciting attacking football. Italy were that at the beginning, but in the semi, we saw they kind of reverted back to type. So maybe are they going to do that again or do they think they can take the game to England? I think not many finals are great games. I think this is going to be a cagey one. I think for England, their hope, their main hope is, as you pointed out before, the pace we have in attack. Now, we know that Chiellini and Bonucci are very good, but they're also very old. I would be telling Saka and Sterling to just run at them at every opportunity. Every time you get the ball, just run at them, run at them, run at them, get them on their heels and trying to get behind that defence, just trying to get behind them because I think that is where the weakness is in the Italian team. It's the pace of the defence. We've seen that they missed Spinazzola a lot. Um, Emerson Palmieri is good, but he doesn't quite have the pace to cover that Spinazzola does. He doesn't have that relationship on the wing with Insigne either. So I think this is the weakness that there, that we can maybe exploit in the Italian team. Um, that being said, we need to win the midfield battle. And I think your midfield is better than our midfield. So we will see. What do you think, Tommy? What are you expecting? Well, we were saying earlier off mic that Italy have won in uh, regular time, we've won in overtime, and we've won at penalties, all in this same tournament, all in these six games. A situation that has never occurred is to be one goal down. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if we were to go one goal down, how the team would react, what would be the strategy to try and even out the score. So that's the only thing that really worries me. Then again, Sterling's speed is a huge concern for me. Um, I think that there will be a huge Jorginho talk in tr- at the training mm-hmm. because he's the guy who knows the prime the best in that team. He's He's been playing every game for Chelsea for the past two years or three years, I don't remember. Um, but I think that if there is a man that kind of can know the insides of England's tactics, that's going to be him. Uh, Let's not forget that uh, Roberto Mancini is also a huge Mm -hmm. Premier League fan. Uh, He's got a lot of respect for um, he's got a lot of respect for the Premier League, and uh, he's he regards it as one of his favorite leagues to watch. I think I, I I think that Immobile doesn't make any sense in this final game. I wouldn't start him. There were people talking about a false nine, maybe, with Berardi and Chiesa and Insigne mm-hmm. acting as a false nine. But again, as we said earlier, maybe changing the lineup for the last game is not the greatest idea. At the end of the day, even though Immobile has sucked major dick, we've managed to like play and score goals even with him on the pitch. Mm-hmm. So might as well go with that one. The middle field battle is going to be an interesting one. Um, But I I do believe it's going to be quite a cagey game, as you said. One thing that I also want to say about Donnarumma, incredible goalkeeper, but he made my heart sink a few times in overtime 
with corner kicks. Mm. He was always trying to go for the ball and he missed it twice in overtime. Yeah, yeah. And one of them could have easily been an own goal and the other one a goal from Spain. If he does that against England with the stones and especially Maguire always yeah. ready to head the yeah. ball towards goal, that's going to be dangerous. So Gigi, we know he's a customary listener of the pod. <laughs> of course. Gigi, Gijo, listen to me. Don't do that shit again. Like you, you got you, you you've got two solid center backs that should be taking care of Maguire and Stones. Stay on your line. Don't try too hard. Because if there is one thing that I have to tell Donna that that I have to say I don't like that much about Donnarumma, sometimes he looks overly confident, and that's the only thing that scared me. He took sometimes against Spain a second too many before punting the ball. With the opposition coming in, people like Pedri, Ferran Torres and such, you don't want to do that shit against the Sterling, especially, or against mm. Kane. So, yeah, it's going to be a good game. I'm very excited. I'm going to be in Milan. Rory and I are going to be together. You can expect follow us on Instagram. I'll say it again, at Anglo Italian Pod and on Twitter at Italian Anglo Pod. I think we're going to be posting stories either way it goes. Rory is not going to be alone because our common friend, Michael, is also half English. And they think he's supporting England a little more than Italy in this final for unknown reasons, since he's always lived in Italy. Um, his mama said that if Belgium had beat Italy, she would have kicked him out of the house. <laughs> um, but um, we shall see. We shall see. I'm very, very excited. The Anglo-Italian final. Rory, have you got anything to add? Nothing, nothing really, apart from the next time you hear our voices. One of them will be very upbeat and one of them will be very downcast. Only time will tell who it will be. So for now, guys, we're going to say um, we're going to say we'll see you later and we'll see you on the other side. We'll see you on the other side of an England final. Oh, my God. England are in a final. It's going to be it's going to be extremely exciting. England, Italy, I think it's going to crown this first season of the pod. And guys, don't worry. As you've heard at the beginning of this episode, that this summer has been a little hectic. Unfortunately, money is always an issue in this world. And so we needed to be making money besides having fun with the pod. So we had to prioritize other things. But you can be sure that we've been taxing day after day. We've been planning for the upcoming season. It's going to be season two. And remember... To do one thing at the end of this pod, tell a friend to listen to it as well and to give us a follow on social media. I'm going to tell you Arrivederci and Forza Italia. Rory, what are you going to say? It's coming home. It is coming home. Oh, God. Is it, has it ever been home, as, a, as, as Michael asked the other day? The last time it came home, my father was six, and he barely remembers it. It was 1966, but it has once been home, and it will be home again. Come on, England! Forza Italia! Talk to you later, guys. Bye.